All right, everybody, welcome to the most recent uh, duration of my office hours. Uh, hopefully, uh, no technical challenges today. Always a bit of a, of a wild card, uh, especially uh, as I look out the window with some very strong wind gusts at the moment. So uh, for better or for worse, uh, the, the reality is uh, our internet connection here is definitely dependent on how much the uh, suspended wires are physically moving. So uh, we'll just have to see. But right now it looks like the connection is all right. Uh, please let me know if there are any issues. Uh, but otherwise, I think we're good to go. Uh, today, I had a few things I wanted to go through first, uh, and then talk about just what the heck is going on in California and the North Pacific and around the world in the context of El Nino and what we should or shouldn't expect moving forward for the rest of the season. Uh, but the first thing I wanted to uh, direct folks' attention to is, and I've been doing this in my most recent chats, by the way, is I often start off uh, these sessions with a link or two that I post in the, the, uh, the live chat section. They'll always be one of the first couple of comments, and usually they'll guide uh, the theme uh, a little bit in terms of uh, what we're going to be talking about today. In this case, it's a slightly uh, tangential link, but it is uh, a direct uh, shared it link, meaning that it's an open access file. You can read the whole thing without a subscription to Nature magazine. Uh, my worldview pr uh, perspective piece that came out earlier this week on the really urgent need uh, for institutions, both universities, uh, research labs, and really anywhere else in the private or public sector that is home to uh, climate or weather experts. So these people with domain expertise in meteorology and climate science and who have uh, the, the, the seen the, the escalating need for public-facing engagement. So literally the exact kind of thing that I'm doing right now in talking with you. There are extremely few institutional outlets uh, that, that, that tangibly support this. And this comes just as a spectacular surprise to many folks I know, even in my own role, which is decidedly a very highly visible one. Uh, I, I don't really know usually more than three or six months in advance if I'm still going to have a job. Uh, and that remains the case today. So. Really, this piece, I think, is a call to action for institutions. And the great irony is that uh, one, one of the strongest recommendations is something that sounds quite boring, uh, maybe to outsiders uh, outside of the academic world, which is institutional and administrative flexibility. The number of barriers that I run into, and despite the fact that I've had a lot of privilege and luck and good timing in all of this, plus a, a level of public visibility, I think that is uh, right out there in the uh, upper tail of the distribution, if you will. Um, the administrative roadblocks and hurdles have prevented uh, progress in this space every single time. And I have really made hundreds of attempts and so far, there still isn't a model in the public or the private sector to support uh, public-facing domain experts. And by the way, this piece is focused on climate change, communication, the kind of work that I do. But really, you could almost swap out the words climate change for any other number of salient uh, societal issues of the day where nuance and context are important and often missing. Increasingly, this th th there is really no venue for for those kinds of public conversations. This used to be the kind of thing we'd see more uh, in the traditional news media and to a certain extent in the public sector, but if anything, these opportunities are even fewer and farther between than they used to be. We've seen this with the collapse of, of a lot of uh, journalistic outlets and these mass layoffs of environmental journalists and uh, health journalists in the middle of a climate crisis uh, and on the back end of a global pandemic. A conspicuous time to be getting rid of all the places to have nuanced conversations about these things. So anyway, if you're interested, check it out. Uh, the link is there. You don't need a subscription. A couple of folks have asked uh, whether they can share it. Yes, this this is this is the only link uh, that will work if you share it. So if you go to the Nature website and share that link, that will not work without a subscription. But the specific ReadCube link I have 
um, shared in the, the live chat section that you can click and you can copy and paste it. That can be shared on social media, via email, whatever. So yes, please do, and everybody should be able to read it without any problems. So just wanted to throw that out there, something that I've been working on, um, scrambling still to figure out how this is going to work moving forward. Uh, but anyway, today's topic of conversation is fortunately much more interesting uh, than administrative uh, details and Kafkaesque bureaucracy, instead focusing on El Nino and the North Pacific and California winter precipitation or not. Um, so let's let's talk and i do have an uh, i think what i hope will end up feeling like uh, an optimistic uh, uh visual that i want to share later uh, not a lot of imagery you'll mostly see me talking for most of this but i will turn the screen over to one animation that i think is uh important to 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 really absorb uh and reflect on a bit so everyone in california is wondering where is the rain well if you're in Northern California, it's actually rained pretty recently in most places. Not a tremendous amount, but a decent soaking and some accumulating snowfall in the mountains. So it certainly isn't bone dry out there in the northern half of the state. It is a lot drier in Southern California, though, where some of these recent systems that have brought a precipitation rain and some mountain snow to Northern California have not made it to the southern part of the state. So this is definitely uh, a bit of a... a situation of, of contrast, as, as is often the case this time of year, north versus south are not necessarily doing uh, the same thing. Uh, but the other big thing that happened was November was, in general, really warm and dry for, for California and a lot of the West. So we have started off uh, this, this, this season, this, this early start to the rainy season in some places, well, dry and warm, and it hasn't been so rainy, and uh, the level of snowpack right now in the mountains is quite low. Granted, it is still very early in the season. Uh, this is still the first week in December, and we wouldn't expect that conditions through mid-December really tell us very much, if anything, about what's going to happen next down the line. This is something I've mentioned before, but there are both statistical, physical, uh, and really just historical reasons why we would not expect what's happened from October through the middle of December to tell us really anything about what's likely to happen the rest of the season. I would argue that's even more true in a year like this year than it usually would be, uh, for reasons that I'll mention in a moment. But what I really want to emphasize in this is that, yes, it has been pretty dry in California uh, for the last month or so, and it looks like it's going to remain pretty dry and pretty warm for the next week or two. But I still think that is very likely to change, perhaps pretty quickly and dramatically, at some point toward the end of December, so mid to late December, and very likely by January. And I realize that we have been talking about this potential pattern shift uh, for a while, uh, and it really hasn't materialized. So this is something that has shown up, you know, a change toward a, a weather pattern. I've talked about it. I've written a couple of blog posts about it since uh, really about early November, so the last 30 or 40 days. And Although it has rained and snowed some, especially in North, Northern California and Central California, it, it really, there hasn't been a profound pattern shift. It's been drier than average and generally warmer than average throughout California. So that big pattern shift hasn't yet arrived. But I still think it's coming, it's just delayed. It's not the, you know, that, that, that is really the, the, the most likely outcome at this point is that we're still going to see that pattern shift arrive um, I hesitate to say sooner rather than later, but at some point this month. And I'll show you the signs of that actually evolving now uh, in a minute or two. But I just want to point out once again and reemphasize, like I did last time, uh, that there are two big reasons why what happens in the early season is very different from what might happen later in the season and why one doesn't really tell us anything about what's likely to happen with the other. And that is essentially because the base state changes. So there is a seasonal progression of the latitude and the strength and the southeastward positioning of the jet stream over the North Pacific that follows a seasonal cycle that retracts northward in the summer, it starts to come southward in the autumn, and really doesn't make it all the way down toward California until January or later in the season. It is 
lagged relative to the meteorological or the astronomical seasons. This is why the Pacific Northwest, in many places, is wettest in autumn, not in winter. So folks say, oh, December, January, February must be the wettest months in Seattle. Often that's not true. Up in Vancouver and Seattle, it can often be wetter in October and November than it is at peak winter. And that is because that is the time of year in autumn uh, farther north where the storm track tends to be squarely directed at that region. Usually in California, that does not happen until late December or January. There can be exceptions, but that would really be the norm. Now it often rains in October, or excuse me, in November and December in California, at least in the northern half of the state, because we do get those transient episodes of storminess. But, you know, the seasonal base state, where the jet stream is, even on a seasonally averaged basis, means that conditions change pretty dramatically from November into December, and then again from December into January. The most solid part of the rainy season in most of California really is January through March in Central and Southern California, and really December through March in Northern California. So what are we seeing right now? Well, the North Coast of California has actually been quite wet recently. Um, in fact, there's even been some flooding and some mudslides up on the highways up there. But that, that's, that's, a, that's a small corner of the state, although it's worth, uh, worth remembering it. Although it does uh, not very representative of conditions even 100 or so miles to the south or east. So even in what uh, other portions of uh, lower northern California, as some folks might call it, central California, depending on where your distinction is around the Bay Area, have not been that wet. The north coast has been pretty damp uh, in recent days. So not all of California has been really dry. What's interesting is that the North Coast has been wet because it's actually been on the, ta the far southern tail end of extremely active weather over the Pacific Northwest over the past couple of weeks. In fact, uh, just this past week, most of the Pacific Northwest saw its warmest and wettest conditions on record for December. So an unusual combination of extremely warm air mass but also extremely wet conditions. So these were not cold storms by any means. In fact, uh, a number of places in the Pacific Northwest set new all-time December temperature records over the past week at the same time that it was raining a lot. So these were not warm, sunny days and dry up there where it was warm. These were very warm and very wet conditions. And these were contributed, as you might expect, by a very strong to extreme pineapple express type atmospheric river system, or really a sequence of these warm atmospheric rivers directed toward the Pacific Northwest. There's been major to even record river flooding in some places, so this is a pretty big deal. Uh, this is essentially occurring, uh, as I mentioned, we, we call these the, the pineapple express type atmospheric rivers because they have uh, connections in some cases all the way back to the subtropics near Hawaii. Uh, and Pineapple Express uh, atmospheric rivers are not just a California phenomenon, but they can actually occur all the way up into the panhandle of southeastern Alaska and British Columbia. In this case, the jet stream is managing to bring moisture from well south of California and making it light, essentially uh, push towards landfall well north of California. So it's tr making this tremendous south to north poleward excursion uh, associated with some very warm and wet storms that have had major flood-related impacts up there, along with really warm conditions. So this has not been a big snow accumulating event. It's, in fact, it's been a snow eater, uh, especially at lower to medium elevations up there. I'm not sure there's much snowpack at all right now at the lower elevations in the Cascades as a result of this very warm, very wet atmospheric river sequence. It does look like things are drying out a bit up there now, uh, but in general, the storm track over the past few weeks has been more active up there uh, than it has been in California. By the way, these are the very wet storms that might otherwise have made it toward California uh, in late November or early December, as had been originally prognosticated. Uh, they are making landfall uh, hundreds of miles further north, which is on the scale of two week predictions from current weather models is actually a, only a modest error. Of course, it's modest in relative terms. In terms of what it means for California, it's, of course, hugely consequential and means that uh, a storm sequence that could have been quite high impact for California essentially missed the state completely to the north. But the storms are out there. This is not, uh, this is not a situation where there's nothing out there over the Pacific. 
uh, there really has been a very active storm track with really moist plumes of, 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 of associated with these warm ARs. What's interesting is that this is exactly the kind of pattern that you'd expect in a winter with uh, widespread record-breaking global ocean warmth. The tropics in the Pacific are warm because of El Nino, of course, but the areas outside of the tropics are not necessarily warmed by El Nino, but they're really warm anyway on their own. And so the waters near Hawaii, the waters west of California, all of that water is anywhere from a couple to several degrees above average. And that's a big deal because that adds a considerable extra amount of juice to the atmosphere. In fact, you may have heard, you probably heard if you've been watching the news, that November 2023 was the warmest month on record, the warmest November on record globally, excuse me. Uh, but what also true was that November 2023 was the moistest November on record globally. So the global, the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere in November 2023 was the highest ever recorded for any November in history, along with being uh, the warmest. This is exactly what we expect to see in a warming climate, by the way, with the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere can hold scales non-linearly, exponentially, in fact, uh, with the amount of warming that we see. So temperature, uh, so the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere, in other words, scales exponentially uh, with temperature. So in warm years, we see progressively larger increases in the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere for each degree of warming. It's not just that there's the same increment of, of increase in water vapor for each degree, but the uh, each successive increment is in fact greater than the last. So what we're seeing this year is a continuation of global record heat and precipitation events, and California has not recently been in on these to the same extent, although it has been really warm. There have been some record warm temperatures, although it's not been particularly moist for the most part. But we're continuing to see warm and wet be the theme of the year in a lot of places. And that might be coming to California sooner than you think, perhaps by late December or January. And this winter has certainly started out warm and dry, and it may keep the warm, uh, but I'm not convinced it's going to keep the dry. Uh, and I do think it's going to get a lot wetter um, in, in, in the weeks and months to come. And as I mentioned, one of the reasons for this is that the, uh, the base state becomes more favorable. The Pacific jet, even under normal circumstances, becomes more and more favorable to deliver storms more directly to California the further we go through the season. But the reason why that matters is that this year we have very strong El Nino conditions in place in the eastern tropical Pacific Ocean, and that tends to uh, result in a further southeastward extension of that Pacific jet and a strengthening of the jet over the central Pacific along with a pronounced Gulf of Alaska low. All of that's favorable for increased precipitation, at least in central and southern California and maybe in northern California too. Additionally, so that's really two pieces, the seasonal base state and the fact that the El Nino forcing increasingly comes into alignment with that base state the farther we go into the season. And it isn't really in alignment, generally speaking, uh, in the autumn. Uh, and by autumn, I'm really including November and December, or most of December at least in this, given this lagged effect of the base state. The other thing that's going on is that the Madden-Julian oscillation, the MJO, is likely to be entering a more active period, as it often does uh, this time of year, and is increasingly going to become in alignment with the same uh, the same influence being exerted by El Nino at some point in the next few weeks. This has been one of the things that hasn't quite materialized in the past couple of uh, past couple of weeks that thought might have happened earlier, but eventually it's very likely it is going to happen, and that will likely kick off a much more active period in California weather this winter. Uh, so the interesting piece in all of this is that the models keep backpedaling. And I think that's fair to say that that's what they've been doing for about the past month or so in terms of this emergence of this pattern and this non-emergence in the real world. So the predictions have progressively not matched reality, which is frustrating for California, but ultimately, I don't think has a great deal of bearing on what's likely to happen later this winter as the base state shifts. I think partly what happens is that the models are not as good at capturing these dramatic pattern changes during the transition seasons when the base state is less well established and less favorable for constructive interference, meaning two waves that amplify each other rather than uh, cancel each other out. 
Right now, what we're seeing are certain waves in the atmosphere that are essentially canceling each other out, despite there being some pretty impressive waves out there to begin with. Eventually, they're going that 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 destructive interference of Rossby waves in the atmosphere is more likely to become constructive interference, and that's going to help the pattern to change. Exactly when that happens is difficult to say. But what I do want to bring up, and this is this is probably a good time for the visual, is what the models are currently showing in their ensemble form for the next couple of weeks. So bear with me here, and I'm actually going to share uh, share a screen here. You'll see it pop up momentarily. Uh, just waiting for it to show up because there's a little bit of a lag on my end as well. Uh, but what you're seeing here is the current, and I just created this, I just pulled this up about, oh, about an hour ago, so it's very up to date. Uh, this is a view from the, the American Model Ensemble for the next 16 days or so. So this is not a specific member of the model, as I often caution folks not to use weeks out, but this is the ensemble average of dozens of individual members run forward for the same period of time. What's interesting is that sometimes when you, uh, when you see these kinds of things, uh, it's kind of a jumbled mess, to be quite honest with you. And I, if you look at the timestamp, the earlier timestamps here, and I'm actually gonna start, hopefully you'll be able to see my cursor on here. I'm gonna start annotating a little bit. Uh, this starts in early December. It actually goes backward in time a couple days and then forward 16 days. So this is about a 20 day sequence, including three days of the past. and. Uh, 16 or so days of the future. This jet stream is kind of wavy, kind of a mess. It's kind of flopping all over the place. And at least in the ensemble average uh, positioning, it's not that strong in any one place. It's just kind of, it's a sign of model uncertainty or the jet stream being kind of wavy. What I really want people to focus on though is that as we get past about December 15th, watch what starts to happen uh, off the coast, uh, just east of Japan in the West Pacific, so all the way thousands of miles on the other side of the Pacific Ocean, is this is known as an East Asian jet extension. So you see this big, uh, initially red and then purple blob. And there's two things about it that I want to emphasize. One is that this is quite strong. This is known as a jet streak, which is a localized region uh, of maximum wind speed within the jet stream. Notice that the units on the right here are in knots, so essentially nautical miles per hour multiplied by 1.1 to get regular miles per hour. It's kind of a silly convention. But anyway, uh, just increase those numbers in the right column by about 10%, and you get, these, you get the numbers that you're actually seeing in miles per hour. So what this is saying is that on average, the ensemble mean, uh, as we get out toward uh, about December 20th towards uh, December 23rd, is for the East Asian jet to be very strong, screaming at like 160 knots. So that's around 175 miles an hour uh, in terms of what the jet stream is doing at the high levels of the atmosphere up, up where the jet aircraft fly. But in addition to that, the other important piece is notice how it starts literally over southern Japan, but then starts to extend progressively eastward uh, over, over the Pacific Ocean and then reaches all the way into the central Pacific really look just about south of Alaska, but due west of California. If you see this progression, this is usually the early sign, uh, a pretty encouraging sign of a potential major, major pattern change. Now, I know a lot of folks are looking at the two-week models right now and saying, oh no, California is still dry by late December. There's still this ridge of high pressure right off the coast. There's no sign of change. But look how different this map looks at the end versus at the beginning. This is a really notable uh, prediction for a very strong and zonally extended East Asian jet. This is what you would see as a precursor toward a very active pattern in California. So, and this is not cherry picked. I looked at all of the major ensembles and all of them are in remarkable agreement. And once we get about 15, 16 days out, they essentially show the same thing. Notice how much more coherent this zonal jet pattern starts to look two weeks out relative to when we start the period right now. It's a dramatic difference. This has to do with some evolution uh, over, over actually the Himalayan mountains uh, and Siberia. Some folks in the comment section have been talking about this uh, rather exotic sounding thing, which is the, uh, the, uh, the, essentially the mountain torque contribution of this cross barrier flow in Asia 
uh, in the Himalayas really was sort of beyond scope of our conversation today. But what I want to emphasize is that A, what's going on half a world away, literally, is very consequential for what might unfold in California. And B, there are a bunch of factors that look like they're going to conspire in California's favor for wet conditions to close out the new year. And I know that that's still a ways away, and we've said this before, but the models actually this season have not shown anywhere near this strong of an East Asian jet extension signal up to this point. So I actually was surprised when I, well, maybe not surprised, but I was, uh, my eyebrows definitely raised when I saw this because this is exactly what we would want to see if California were going to become uh, very active and stormy a few days after the last frame here. So it may yet take another couple weeks to get there, and that may put us through many of the winter holidays with California being on the warm and dry side with high pressure. I guess on the plus side, some relatively easier holiday travel may be along the West Coast, but I think that once we get toward the end of the calendar year, that will probably really change, and that really would be in alignment with what we're seeing uh, with the matted Julian oscillation and its progression uh, through the through the atmosphere, it's consistent with what we'd expect to see with shifts in the seasonal base state and its interaction with El Nino, and it's consistent with several other little pieces uh, out there as well. Let me take a sip of tea since I'm starting to lose my voice early in this conversation. Oh, and there's one other thing I wanted to point out on this map. Not only are we seeing this extended uh, East Asian jet uh, toward later in December in all of the ensembles right now, but also closer to home, take a look at this subtropical jet that starts to become a little more coherent south of California and into the southeastern U.S. That's a classic El Nino-like response. And what it can mean is that once this East Asian jet extension makes it another 500 miles or so further east, the, the polar jet, which is what this is, uh, well, I guess really this is a merged subtropical and polar jet. Here, as we get east over the United States, there really is no coherent polar jet by the end of this period, but there is a consolidated subtropical jet. These, these, the subtropical, sub, uh, subpolar jet merger uh, may occur pretty close to California, and that's when things can get really exciting. Uh, in terms of dynamic meteorology. So that's speculative at this point because that's still even further out beyond the 16 days. But I think that this particular indication of a very strong and, and very coherent, again, this is the average of dozens of model members and it's showing this remarkable extension of the jet. It, you know, This is not just one random member of the model, this is all the dozens of members, you smooth them out and they still have this really impressive signal. So that's currently what I'm thinking about uh, in terms of where we're headed. I'm gonna go back to uh, stopping the, the screen share here. You're gonna see my face again. Uh, I'm gonna come back into the studio uh, and um, all right, there we go. So really all of this is to say, I know it's been frustrating. Um, it's not encouraging to see a slow start to the rainy season or the snowpack season, but that doesn't necessarily tell us what's going to happen next. It is worth noting, by the way, that there's, you know, we, we've, we've pointed this out before, uh, that the, the shoulder seasons in California are expected to become considerably warmer and drier, but the core winter season months are not expected to become drier and might actually become wetter on average. Increasing whiplash being the name of the game, but those core winter months are still going to be really important to California, and we really increasingly, in fact, our, our own research suggests that the fall and spring will be less and less reliable indicators of the water year to come. Not that they were ever very good indicators to begin with, but they'll become even less so as the opposite changes in hydroclimate will likely unfold in fall and spring versus winter, with fall and spring drying in the long run, but no drying in winter and maybe even things getting somewhat wetter, uh, punctuated by these large swings between wet and dry. So we will still see dry winters, and we may even see more uh, dry winters, but we will also see wetter winters, and it may be that the wetter winters went out in that balance. We're not totally sure about that, but that's currently uh, uh, climate science for California's future in a nutshell. Ask me more about that later. But what I really want to emphasize is that the autumn tells us next to nothing about what the coming winter is likely to hold, 
right now there is actually a pretty convincing signal uh, that out there in the model jet structure uh, that toward late December we're going to get things that might get interesting in California. And that would be consistent with seasonal predictions with what we know theoretically about El Nino, the climatological seasonal base state. The other thing that I would emphasize is that the latest suite of seasonal model predictions came out today and yesterday. So the European model a couple of days ago and the North American modeling suite came out, I believe it was yesterday. And they're actually showing higher confidence in a wetter core winter season this year than they did previous to the last few weeks of initial conditions. So there was actually less uh, intermodel agreement that this winter would end up wetter than average um, until the past couple of weeks when that consensus has really emerged. Almost all of the seasonal predictive models are now pointing towards wetter than average conditions. Granted, you got to look beyond December to see that. A lot of folks are posting these December plots, and it's not that surprising because, as I mentioned, December is distinctly different from January through March in terms of the degree to which El Nino or La Nina or Madden-Julian oscillation seasonal to subseasonal scale teleconnections can actually affect the weather. It's much easier for them to do so later in the season as the base state shifts, and as far as we can tell, the seasonal predictions right now still indicate a pretty strong tilt in the odds towards wetter than average conditions, particularly in Central and Southern California, but also in Northern California, with a high likelihood of warmer than average conditions. And this gets me to my next point, which is snowpack. It is entirely possible that this year ends up well above average in terms of water year precipitation, but below average for snowpack. And that's because this winter is likely to be warm. It's already been warm. We're starting off with a snow deficit. And this year, sometimes that matters because we don't have the advantage of a nice, deep, cold layer of snow uh, to condition uh, things for lots of additional snow to come. Uh, if we saw events like the Pacific Northwest saw last week, uh, then that would be, as I mentioned, kind of a snow-eating event, a snow-melting event uh, on net, on balance, at elevations below seven or 8,000 feet. So without a deep snowpack, too, it's much easier to melt or to thaw a, 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 a shallow snowpack than a deep one. So if you have, you know, 10, 15 feet of snow on the ground, you get some warm rain, and for the most part, that warm rain is going to be largely absorbed by the snowpack. That's actually what happened a few times last winter. But if you have just 6 to 12 inches of low, relatively low water content snow, and then you get a huge Pineapple Express atmospheric river storm, there's a chance you're actually going to be able to melt all that snow, which has two negative outcomes. One is you've lost the snow, and two, all of that water that was in the snow now makes it into, uh, into the rivers immediately and contributes to flood risk. So until we have a deep snowpack, if we get a deep snowpack this winter, and I think that's a real question at lower elevations, or at least medium, or by lower I mean like four, five, six thousand feet elevations, um, lower relative to the, to, the, to the Sierra Crest, I suppose, um, that really leaves open the possibility that many places will see wetter than average conditions from a precipitation perspective, but not see an above average snowpack. And increasingly that, again, is something we expect to be a signature of climate change in California. We've already seen that in many recent years, not last year. Last year was an incredible snow year with very cold conditions and a lot of low snow. But that's, at this point, an enormous anomaly. So last winter's snow accumulation and low temperatures were much more anomalous than, than the precipitation, actually, in terms of what we expect to see moving forward. I'm very confident we'll see winters considerably wetter than the one we just saw last year in a warming climate. I would be pretty astonished if we ever saw a winter colder than last winter, and it essentially with all of that low elevation snowfall and these enormous amounts of snow at relatively low elevations, down at three and 4,000 feet in some places, even into Southern California, that's just getting really hard to achieve, and so it was relatively exceptional that it happened last year. This year, I do not expect to see a repeat, even though it could again be a second consecutive wet winter, which would be interesting. We have not seen one of those in a long time. All right, uh, time for another sip of tea. You may see an ad roll or something, but it's just going to be like 20 seconds, I promise.
All right. Thanks for thanks for sticking with me, everybody. Um, I would like to go through the comments now. There aren't too many, so I'll be able to, I think, get through them. And this is a good opportunity, folks, if you are uh, in the in the comment section and do have questions, today is a good day to ask them if they're related to anything I've talked about today. So let's say uh, that anything that's on topic today will include uh, public-facing science communication, especially in a weather climate context, um, El Nino, uh, California winter precipitation, either this year or generally, uh, and climate change in the context of any of these things, or what has just unfolded in the Pacific Northwest as well. So feel free to add those questions, and while you think about them, I'm going to go down the list and address uh, what's here already. Yeah, so just to reiterate, uh, since Steve asked the question, you can definitely share the link to that nature uh, perspective piece. In fact, I encourage you to do so. That's what, it's, that's what that particular link is designed for. Uh, thanks for the kind words, folks. Um, as David points out, in 9798, um, it, yeah, so in 9798, which was a major El Nino event, that happened also to be a very wet year in most of California, uh, November and December were wet. But I guess my point is uh, that we that may or may not even had directly to do with El Nino that year. That, that may have actually been somewhat random or for other reasons. Uh, you know, the, the, the autumn, uh, especially through November, but also to a certain extent up through uh, December, is really just driven by things other than the kind of consistent or well-understood tropical forcings. El Nino would be one of them, the Madden Julian Oscillation would be another one, that are really important later in the winter. That's just the reality. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, 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 97, 98, sure, you know, it was super wet to start and it stayed super wet. That's part of the reason why the annual totals were so spectacular in some places that year, by the way, is because it wasn't just the core months that were super wet, but it was also the, the shoulder seasons that, that were quite damp as well. But I don't necessarily think we should expect that to happen every time we have a big El Nino event, even if the El Nino event does in fact end up bringing wetter than average conditions during the core winter months. I just don't really think uh, we can point to one event and tell us uh, what we should think other future events should look like. Um, so none of them occur in a vacuum. And also, you know, 97, 98 was a long time ago in a climate context. You know, the climate is very different already than it was back in 98, considerably warmer. And there are other things going on too that are quite different uh, than back in the late 90s in terms of natural periodic oscillations aside from El Nino. Uh, Kino asks, uh, when you say November 2023 was the moistest uh, November on record, is that saying wettest or humidity? In this case, it is a hum it, it's a it's a statement about absolute humidity in the in the air. So literally, the amount of moisture in the air. Uh, if it was, uh, it may also have been the wettest. I just haven't looked at the numbers, but it looks uh, it's pretty clear that by a significant margin, it was the mo the November with the most cumulative atmospheric water vapor as well as being the warmest November, which again is exactly what you'd expect. But it is an interesting illustration of how having a very moist atmosphere does not necessarily mean that it rains a lot in any given place. It does mean that it rains a lot globally in the global average. So it's raining somewhere a lot, but in any given place, there being a lot of moisture in the atmosphere globally or even regionally doesn't necessarily tell you that it's gonna rain a lot. You still need those mechanisms to squeeze out the moisture in one place versus another. So what goes up must come down, uh, but it doesn't have to come down in the same place uh, from wh from whence it went up. Uh, which I, I guess that's uh, to to torture that aphorism. Uh, that's sort of what we've been seeing this year. Another question, given anomalously warm water off of the Pacific coast on top of a strong El Nino, do you think California could see unusually intense thunderstorm events this winter? That's a good question. And although there has been no research on this that I'm aware of, um, none whatsoever, which is interesting, I think that there's a reasonable chance that the answer is yes. I think we may have actually seen a bit of a preview 
about this already uh, earlier this season. So we did actually have some active weather in Northern California in October where there was that big lumbering cutoff low, if you recall. It didn't behave as expected either. I think it was October, maybe it was early November. Apologies, there's a lot of, been a lot of 12 hour days recently. Um, but the, the, the long and the short of it is that that cutoff low generated a lot of lightning and some pretty heavy convective activity over California. Um, more so than perhaps I would have expected from the system. It wasn't a particularly impressive system and yet it generated an awful lot of thunderstorm activity. I think part of the surface-based instability there probably was amplified by the fact that the nearshore water temperatures and the offshore water temperatures are anywhere from, as I mentioned, a couple to a few degrees warmer than average. So I do think then that uh, that there, there you know one, one way to increase the instability in the atmosphere is to increase the amount of moisture uh, and the temperature in the lowest levels of the atmosphere. Uh, you can also have really cold, dry air at upper levels of the atmosphere, but the other thing you can do is add extra moisture and heat in the lower levels, and that is what you do when the ocean is warmer uh, than average. You have That translates to warmer near-surface temperatures, obviously, but it also translates to increased rates of evaporation and so greater surface moisture. So unless the upper atmosphere is also moister and also colder than usual, then that would tend to result in a less stable, more, in other words, more unstable atmospheric calm. It doesn't mean that there's just thunderstorms popping up out of the ether all the time. I mean, you can look out the window and see that, but it does mean that when conditions might otherwise be slightly favorable for thunderstorms during a winter storm, they might be more moderately favorable for thunderstorms rather than just being slightly so. So that, you know, yes, I think that's plausible. I think we see that, we actually see that this is in a supplementary figure that's technically published, but uh, never got any discussion in one of our published papers, is that we do see that in future simulated atmospheric river storms, there is more convective available potential energy and perhaps more convective or thunderstorm activity associated with atmospheric rivers in a warming climate in California, and that may be due to destabilization of the boundary layer uh, from, from increases in that, in that moisture uh, and energy flux from the warmer oceans. That's just a hypothesis. We haven't really dug into it. It'd be a great research project for someone to take a look at, but right now, it, it's a, I, if this were Mythbusters, I'd stamp it as plausible, uh, but as yet unconfirmed. Question from Lori. Um, are you still stalled on the new flood risk maps for California due to funding? Um, to my knowledge, it's still going through behind the scenes uh, at the Department of Water Resources, but, and I'll be, you know, I'm happy to be involved once they're available, but from my part, yes, I don't have uh, any additional funding to, to engage on, on that, or most other things further, at least in an official capacity, so, um, so it goes, um, this seems to be the trend. A question from Chris, um, El Nino's warm water comes from the West Pacific. Is it possible that some of the warmth from this El Nino is just from global warming and the reason why the West Pacific is still warm is due to global warming? Okay, um, well, there's a lot, there's a lot to, there's a lot in here. So El Nino is characterized by, a, by an anomalous warming of the Eastern tropical Pacific Ocean. Now it is true that during a big El Nino event, that some of the warm water from the West Pacific, it does slosh eastward. So there is literally a slope of the sea surface. On average, the West Pacific is higher than the East Pacific. So the whole, the whole ocean basin is literally slanted, uh, like a very in, imperceptibly gradual hill due to the configuration of the continents and wind patterns that cause that water to pile up in the West Pacific. It is, this, it is the reversal of those usual trade winds that allow water to pile up in the West Pacific normally that allows some of that gradient to slacken and some of that warmer water from the West to slosh eastward. But it's not like the warm water out by Indonesia is like traversing the whole Pacific Ocean and ending up near Peru or something. The sloshing effect is not, it, it's modest. What's really happening during El Nino, at least in the East Pacific, is that, we're, that the deep cold water upwelling near the coast of Peru that makes that part of the world such a rich uh, and diverse uh, uh, fishery with so much diversity of, of living things in the ocean there, nutrient-rich water upwelling from beneath. 
And so um, really it's the shutting off the upwelling that causes the biggest changes uh, in uh, ocean surface temperature in the eastern tropical, tropical Pacific. And then the next largest thing actually has to come from changes in cloud and precipitation patterns. So you actually end up seeing changes in ocean surface salinity as it starts raining in places where it doesn't usually over the ocean. And so all of these things, these changes in the, the you kill off the upwelling, you change the cloud patterns, the eastern Pacific uh, Ocean in the tropics warms a lot relative to usual. The West Pacific cools relative to usual, but notably during recent El Nino events, the West Pacific has not cooled to below average levels. It's just cooled relative to the really, really record warm levels that it was before the El Nino event. So yes, that part I think is due to global warming. And the problem with this is, I mean, we're getting combinations of ocean temperature patterns that we've never seen before this year. We've never had a strong El Nino event with the non-tropical portions of the Pacific as warm as they are right now. That means that there's a lot more moisture to work with for storms that do form, but there might be kind of wonky jet stream behavior or storm track behavior because the gradient in ocean surface temperatures, and that does propagate all the way up into the atmosphere uh, and, and has relevance for the jet stream, isn't what we would expect it to be in all cases. So on the plus side, there's a bunch of extra moisture out there that could potentially fall out of the atmosphere as rain, but all of these blobby warm temperatures in places we're not used to seeing them kind of throw a wrench in our canonical understanding of these uh, remote teleconnections. So uh, I'm not quite sure if I answered the question there. There are big questions about what might happen with El Nino and La Nina in a warming climate. And while we do think that the most extreme El Nino and La Nina events will become even more extreme, we actually don't really know anymore what's going to happen on average. We thought we kind of knew that we'd see a trend toward a more El Nino like base state, uh, but that is now in question. We certainly haven't seen that in the real world, which means that either our models are wrong, which is a problem, or that in the real world, we're just experiencing a really, really unlikely random iteration of something kind of wonky through bad luck. At this point, we don't know which it is, but the longer it goes on that we don't see a trend toward a more El Nino-like state on average, the more likely it becomes that something is wrong in our predictions about the future with respect to El Nino, and that is a huge scientific conundrum right now. All right, let's see. Uh, do you have any insights about the kind of conditions that would be most likely to generate uh, flooding in the California Bay Delta region? Warmer storms seem more threatening to the levee systems than the colder storms last year. I think that's generally true. I mean, ultimately, the delta is the terminus of two major watersheds in California, the Sacramento and the San Joaquin, really draining the, the, not only the western slopes uh, up, to the, up to the Sierra uh, crest of uh, most of the Sierra Nevada mountains, but also the eastern slopes of the coast ranges and the southern portion of, of, of um, the, the mountains up in Shasta. Uh, the, so we have a huge watershed in the Sacramento and, and the San Joaquin, in, at least in California terms, that are susceptible to very intense precipitation accumulation, although a lot of that precipitation can accumulate as snow. If it does so, it then melts later. It doesn't melt the moment it falls. It accumulates, it stays frozen on the ground, and it melts, hopefully, uh, in the spring and summer when it's needed and convenient. If we get really warm storms, though, uh, that precipitation either falls as rain in the first place and never becomes snow at all, or it, it falls as snow and then melts as rains follow. So that would be the model for the largest flood risk in the Bay Delta region would be events that are very wet and also very warm, because it would mean that a lot of the water that would otherwise accumulate as snow and then melt later, not contributing to immediate runoff, would uh, actually be part of the runoff that's making it to the Bay Delta. Uh, so you have all of that water from the Sacramento and San Joaquin that gets funneled ultimately through the Cartinez Strait. Uh, all of that water from all of California then ends up going uh, draining into San Francisco Bay through that relatively narrow passageway. And the Delta itself this constellation of areas that historically would have been a mix of land and water and in the future may also be uh, a mix, uh, heterogeneous, an increasingly heterogeneous mix of land and water with sea level rise and increased flood risk. Uh, but anyway, it's the really big, but particularly the really warm storms that are the challenge, especially because those are the ones that are gonna wreak havoc in the San Joaquin watershed. 
because there's a lot of territory at high elevations in that watershed. And so there's a lot of room for large snow accumulations to become uh, runoff as rain instead. And this is exactly what we expect to see in a warming climate, by the way. There's an expectation that peak flows on the San Joaquin system could increase from anywhere uh, uh, from about uh, twofold to fourfold above historic peaks, depending on uh, really how much more warming we see. Those are very large numbers, and they are a huge concern from a flood risk perspective, particularly in the San Joaquin Basin, but then also into the delta, because of course the delta is integrating all of that extra water uh, into the southern reaches of its own uh, watershed. Thoughts on earthquake weather? There, there is no earthquake weather. weather. There, there is absolutely no scientific evidence of any connections between weather conditions and seismic risk. Um, interestingly, there can be links between observed weather and post-seismic risks, like if, for example, you had a big earthquake uh, during a major flood event, uh, which would increase the risk of uh, further increase the risk of landslides or, or levee or dam uh, failures. Or if you had a big earthquake during a terrible drought or during an offshore wind event, which would greatly increase the risk of uh, essentially wild and, and urban interface fires. But in terms of weather and earthquakes uh, having a causal connection, uh, the answer is is no. Earthquakes uh, don't change the weather, and the weather doesn't cause earthquakes. Um, a question from Ed, actually, which gets to what I did want to close with anyway. Uh, a little early thinking ahead to next summer, but does uh, an El Nino shaping up like this look, look, look like it's uh, portend an active monsoon season next year? Well, first of all, Monsoon prediction is even harder uh, than seasonal winter precip uh, prediction in California, so that's that's saying something. But the more important thing is that there's actually a high likelihood that we flip rapidly from strong El Nino to significant La Nina conditions again already by next spring, late next spring into early next summer. That's a strong expectation of the seasonal models, and honestly, from an El Nino and La Nina prediction perspective, the models have been really good in recent years. They've captured most of the major evolutions between El Nino and La Nina. So there's a good, we have a good shot of being in La Nina conditions already by late spring or early summer next year. That's speculation. Usually I wouldn't say anything about ENSO a year out, but this year, again, conditioned on what we're seeing right now, it would not be at all surprising to see a rapid transition from a strong El Nino to a significant La Nina immediately thereafter. In fact, that often happens. And that's what the models are predicting right now. So next summer, folks in the Atlantic hurricane uh, and insurance industry are already freaking out because, stay tuned, uh, next summer looks like you could see a combination of significant La Nina conditions and record warm Atlantic ocean water, which is probably the worst imaginable scenario for an extremely hyperactive uh, Atlantic hurricane season. So that's not really a California weather thing, at least not yet, uh, but um, something to keep an eye on for next year. All right. Well, I think uh, I know there's a few questions that are still coming in, but I'm actually starting to lose my voice, so I may I may need to uh, to cut it off there. Uh, plus, I think Luna the dog needs to go outside, so she's signaling me. Uh, great engagement today. Great to chat with folks. Please do check out the Nature of Worldview piece. Um, again, it's open access if you use the link in the chat section, and. Uh, yeah, I think as always, I appreciate uh, the folks who, who regularly participate in these. I'm going to continue to do them. Oh, one thing I did want to mention. For anybody uh, who's on uh, journalists or scientists or, or otherwise who will be at the American Geophysical Union fall meeting next week in San Francisco, I will be there. My schedule is already extremely, alarmingly, insanely full, but I, there are still a few windows where I could potentially squeeze in some other interactions. So just let me know. If you're around and interested, I'll try and make that, uh, at least see you in the poster hall or something. Um, all right, well, and, and that also, on a programming note, I probably will not have live office hours next week just because I'm going to be stuck on conference center or hotel Wi-Fi, which um, 
as challenging as sometimes it is uh, from home, it's usually worse in those settings. So unless there's some crazy breaking news, California relevant weather event in the next uh, 10 days, which does not appear likely, hopefully in about 10 or 12 days, I can come back and say, hey, you know those things that were that, that big pattern change that was 16 days out? Uh, well, it's it's now only three or four days out. So it would be great to be able to say that, fingers crossed. Otherwise, enjoy relatively mild and calm weather in California in the days to come. 